Oops. Uh, got it. So welcome everyone for this meeting that is on how to design an effective research poster. And we thought about having this session just because many times when you are a graduate student or even faculty, if you haven't had that much of experience, um, nobody really tells you that there is a thing as uh, as like research posters unless you're a faculty. At that point, you know. But when you're a graduate student, suddenly they tell you, yes, your talk has been accepted for an oral presentation or a poster presentation. You're like, what, a poster? What is a poster? Like whatever I see on the wall, well, we know that for research it's a little different. So today, um, uh, Shannon, Miranda, and I will be telling you about uh, different um, approaches on how to improve your um, uh, poster um, design skills. And we're gonna be using data and posters from real people. So um, I think unless one of the things was just like uh, uh, designed by Shannon, I think everything else was, uh, it's real. It's by uh, uh, different members from the first gen uh, committee that were nice enough to share things that they were proud of and not so proud of. So uh, we'll get to see what, um, how, we can work around this. So how we're gonna structure this presentation is, well, as I said, the presenters today are uh, Shannon Bryan, who's a postdoc at Rutgers, uh, Marana McCarroll, who's faculty at Smith College, and then myself, Ander Beristein, and I'm a professor at St. Louis University. So how we're gonna structure this presentation is first, we're just gonna uh, introduce this topic then we'll talk about what a research poster is. Maybe you know what it is, but just like in a nutshell, I'll just go over it uh, really quickly. Then Miranda is gonna take over and she's gonna talk about uh, uh, graphic design applied for um, for uh, poster presentations. And she'll talk about CARP, contrast, alignment, repetition, and proximity. Then Shannon will take over after her and she'll talk about how to curate content. And then I'll finish the presentation with uh, recommendations for posters for the LSA meeting that is happening in January. And um, we have the practical exercises at the end, but you'll see that we're gonna have practical exercises integrated along each one of the sections. So it's gonna be more dynamic and, and we hope that it is enjoyable for everyone. Uh, Miranda or Shannon, would you like to add anything else before we start? Perfect, okay, well then I'll go ahead and just let you know that a research poster is a visual presentation of information. And notice that we emphasize visual because that's the main goal for a poster. A poster should not present the same amount of information as written uh, version of the paper would because normally we send an abstract, they tell us that it's been accepted for a poster presentation. And the thing that we think of doing is just copying and pasting the abstract sections onto the onto the, the, the poster. And we should not do that because there are two different types of media. Um, for those of you that might not be so used to doing poster presentations, it is quite a unique type of presentation. Why? Because usually poster presentations are given one hour, one hour and a half, maybe even two hours of a time slot within a conference. And you should know that, uh, and, and, and this makes you wonder, how long is the poster presentation, right? Do I have to be talking for an hour and a half the whole time? And usually, yes, but it doesn't mean that your presentation is just gonna be one hour long. Uh, we recommend to have at least two types of, of, of spiels or type of uh, types of presentation. Uh, you should have a long one, which should be a six to seven minute long uh, presentation that walks you through the whole poster or a short one in case somebody is just walking by and really asks you, what should I know about your poster? And we recommend that that should be one to two minutes. Um, always questions for later, um, because as we know, we always have questions and we always like giving feedback or getting feedback, right? So you should have technically at least, uh, you should prepare a seven minute presentation that will walk you through each one of the sections of your poster. And that is what you will be uh, telling the attendees. Uh, or as I said, a two minute one, if somebody cannot stay for all that time. 
So um, what is maybe a little tedious about poster presentations is that you will generally repeat the presentation over and over until the end of the session. So you, you do your presentation, it ends, and then somebody new walks by, and then they stand in front of you, and maybe they're just looking at the poster, but maybe this is just like a sign or a cue for you to come in and say, hey, do you want me to give you my presentation? And they'll say, of course, because uh, it's nicer to hear someone than just reading the whole poster. So you'll do that. And something that you should know if you've never done a poster presentation is that you don't have to restart your presentation if somebody new shows up to your poster, okay? Like they, they you are the star in a way. You are the one selling your product, which is your research. So if you've already started and you're halfway through your presentation, well, you're not gonna start again. They can just keep walking and come back when you're done or you can tell them, yeah, I'll be, I'll be done in like two minutes. So uh, yeah. Miranda? Uh, thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about graphic design. I'll go over the main four principles of graphic design um, and give examples of good use and, and bad and poor use or ineffective use of them. And then I will also end it with a little bit of a discussion about um, accessibility in design. Um, one of the things to consider is colors, fonts, and things like that to make it accessible to all people. So first, we're going to start with the four principles of graphic design. The CARP, contrast, alignment, repetition, proximity, really doesn't matter which way you talk about them. But as we are in linguistics, we must have a good acronym for all the things we are required. OK, so the first one of this is contrast. Contrast basically draws the eye. It brings the eye um, to where you want it, right? So you can contrast a color. Like that's what we think of most often, right? contrasting complementary colors, um, things like that. But really, you can also contrast typefaces, space, uh, directions, lines. There's lots of things that you can use to draw contrast. Um, but the one that I see people use most often is color, especially in posters like these. And you really want to pay attention to the colors that you are contrasting. They may look really great to you, um, but people with, uh, depending on the type of color blindness, color blindness comes in, uh, I think, three subtypes, if I remember, maybe even more. But one of the things with Keatings is just never use red on green or green on red. Um, for those, the most common types of colorblindness, red and green look the same. So you won't convey meaningful information if you use that for a small portion of the population, but still, it's a good practice not to use. Um, and one way we can kind of play with contrast, research posters tend not to be terribly colorful. One, it costs a lot of money, different color. You're not going to do a whole research poster in color. Uh, but in the areas that you do use color for contrast, shadowing um, can be a really effective one, and outlining can be really effective, especially on your fonts. Um, if we look at the next slide, we'll look at an ineffective use of contrast. So this is the one time that I don't have a real poster because I went through all the posters that we had examples from, and we all did pretty well. Right, like I was really impressed. Um, <laughs> so I had to find one online. Um, if you look for bad contrast, there are tons of examples online. But here was one that looks pretty, right? It's got this lovely pink, this lovely purple, this darker shade of pink, like a magenta color, um, some turquoise in there or teal. But while there's great contrast between the word introduction, the white background and the magenta box, if we look at the actual words, Dr. Bright Carbon, which I really wish was somebody's name, um, and the text on neurodegenerative diseases, there isn't a lot of contrast. And if somebody were standing, say, nobody, rarely, some people do come up really close to your poster. <laughs> but often people keep a social distance of about three feet from your poster. So from three feet away, this might be very difficult to see. Um, so just keep that in mind that you want to draw people's eye, you want to use contrast. On the next slide, we have a good example of contrast. Um, and I'm sure Andrew really likes to use his example here. But the most place that I see this contrast happening is in header, is in the, in the title of the poster. People love to do a color block at the top. Um, and if we look here, we have this really lovely white and light gray on a dark color, right? Black on light colors work well, white on dark colors work well. Right, so we have this light blue that contrasts not only with the red, but also with the white and the gray, right? And so while this may not be an intentional thing, um, we are immediately drawn to the email address 
and the website of Ander, right? That's where it pulls our eye. So just consider what you're putting in colors. You may think they're nice colors, um, but remember, you may not mean to draw the eye to that. Uh, in this case, sorry, Ander, if I were designing this, I probably would flip it and make the title blue and the other stuff white, right? Just because the title's where I want my eye to go. Um, and then probably the name in white and then the other information in gray. But think about that. You use contrast to draw the eye. And so take advantage of that. Maybe your results section, you want to have something that's a nice contrast in there so that people will be immediately drawn to the contrast, uh, onto your results or your research question, right? So just remember that. That's what contrast can do for us when we're looking at a poster. It can help direct the audience to the important parts of your poster. And so the next thing on CARP is alignment. Now, alignment's hard. <laughs> I get this, but there's a lot of tools that have been introduced, right, um, recently to make sure that everything aligns in your poster. You want to be conscious of every single element, from the bullet points to the title elements uh, to your chart, right? You want to align every object with the edge of another object, right? You want to make sure that every keep all the spaces aligned and that they're consistent throughout the poster. Um, and this is really important in presenting a very professional looking um, poster. If you're working in, I make most of my posters in PowerPoint. I just set the parameters to 48 inches and 36 inches, so four feet and three feet, which is pretty much the often the most common size of poster you'll do for uh, a conference. Um, and if you'll notice that when you're working within Microsoft Power, within PowerPoint, uh, when you move things, grid lines pop up for you. And that can be really helpful so that you make sure you align. If not, um, in some of, I think in Microsoft, you can actually say view grid and have it grid out your screen so that you can see and make sure everything lines up. So we have an example from two of my posters where I did a good job and where I did not so good of a job. <laughs> so here are my two posters. Um, on the left, we have effective alignment. If you look the, um, Throughout the poster, I don't have the whole poster on here, but the space between the numbering and the and the, the plural definite article, for example, is exactly the same for everyone. The A, the B, and the C align with the left edge of the P of plural, right? And then if we look, the bullet points up below, the first outer bullet points align with the edge of the parentheses on the two, right? So here we have consistent spacing between every single element and everything is aligning. And one thing to remember is left align is your friend. <laughs> Center align only when you need to, but left align is the thing we tend to use most. Now, if we look at my right side one, there the alignment's just all messed up. <laughs> right? um, I have some good alignment between the first two items, but then when you look at the A's and the one, two, threes, my A's and my ones are aligning, so it's not showing this hierarchical relationship that I want to show. Um, and in addition, the spacing between the Roman numerals one, two, three, and the beginning text doesn't align with the A's and the B's above it and below it, right? So these are just things that you want to consider. Everything needs to align with something else. You do not want to go too close to the edges of your poster either. This is just a small thing to think about with alignment is white space counts. White space helps your reader. And having this nice white edge around makes it look very tidy, but also you don't want anything to get cut off when you're printing it because nothing's worse than picking up your poster, say in New York City, opening it up and realizing that edges of your poster are just gone. <laughs> so please consider that when you're doing your alignment. So we have contrast, alignment, and now repetition. Repetition creates consistency. This doesn't mean repeating the same word or things like this. This means repeating elements. So it's just like when you're designing a PowerPoint slide, if you've designed those, you want to use the same theme throughout. So pick a bullet point, pick a color, a size for that bullet point, and keep it consistent, right? Make sure that when you use colors, for example, that if you're using color, a, a same color throughout, make sure that color is tied to some sort of idea. Right, you want to make sure that so whenever I see something red, I'm going to know that red encodes this information. Um, and so don't alternate just because it looks pretty. 
use that to your advantage. Convey information through repeated elements. So, for example, make sure every header is the same size font. So if it's a header, it's going to have, say, a 120-point font. If it's a subheader, it's going to have a 100-point font. And that you don't vary these sizes just to make things fit. If your header isn't going to fit in every place you need a header, shrink all of them, right? So just because you think you're just messing with the points a little bit, some of us notice these things. Um, same thing with the type of font. Make sure you use the same font through the whole poster. Don't just switch to, to I don't know, Monticello, and then to Arial, and then to Calibri. Like, it is very confusing. If you want to use your font to create some sort of contrast, that is fine. That makes sense sometimes. Also, if you're using a sans serif font, which is what I recommend for everything, you might have to switch to Dulo Sill or a Times New Roman, something serif when you're doing IPA. Because in IPA, the serifs matter sometimes. So that's just one place where in our field, you might have to do something a little bit different. So let's look at some examples, effective and ineffective of repetition. So here we have lovely repetition of color. Um, the colors associated with each group means the same thing across the group, right? So if I used orange in the aerodynamics, it's encoding the same condition as the acoustic is, right? So, and if you look at this whole poster, this person has used green, blue, and orange throughout the poster to always code the same variables or conditions, right? And so I know that I can look across this whole poster and if I just am concerned with, I can't remember what this was, um, if I'm concerned with the L1 English group, which is orange, I know throughout that whole poster, all I have to do is look for the orange. And this is really easy for your audience. So let's look at the next one that's not as effective use of color. So here we have the one issue of red on green, which is colorblind unfriendly. Um, red is used repeatedly here, but outside the charts, it's not uniting an idea. Um, instead, it's more like providing, like, uh, look at this. But because it's used in the charts, people want it to keep meaning the same thing throughout. So the viewer may mistakenly think that all red words are related in some way. Um, you know how we like to find patterns as human beings, and we'll try to find a pattern even when it's actually not there. So it would be better if each color was linked to either a single idea, a single language, or a single linguistic pattern in this case. Um, and that can be a really effective way is make use of these colors to help code things throughout your poster. And our last one that we come to is proximity. This seems logical. Put like things together. <laughs> Group the like with the like. Separate items that aren't related to each other. Vary the space between them to show closeness or importance. Things that, are, that share ideas or develop upon each other should be grouped near each other. They should be proximal, right? that shows the importance. So for example, at the top of your poster, you put the title of your poster, you put your name, your affiliation, your email. It's all grouped together because that's the basic information of your poster. That's what anybody would need to be able to get a copy of it from you or something. So we group those all together. Um, if we look at this first example here, this is an effective use of proximity. Here, the results of the research questions are all grouped together, which is really effective. And if we look on the left-hand side, they've grouped together the abstract and the background, and I think the, I forgot to expand this, I can't remember what else they grouped together. But here, the everything to do with the experiments, the results of the experiments is to the right. It's all grouped together. They also did a really great job of using some color in this one too. This isn't like the, the typical posters we see though, is it? It's much more um, infographic-y or magazine-like, which is kind of a nice change. We've been stuck in the three column research poster for a very long time, people. It is nice to break out of it a little bit. And now the next example we have is one that's more of an ineffective use of proximity. So here we have on the left, the introduction, and then they talk about implicit bias in language. But unfortunately, on the far right upper corner is the current finding about implicit bias in language. That really should, because it's about the same idea and it's giving us actual, you know, like more details, it should be grouped on the left with the other um, ideas that are in there. 
So this is just one example of the way that we can use basic design principles for our research posters. Many of us are not trained in graphic design. I was not trained in graphic design. I happen to learn more about graphic design because I make my students design infographics for a class. So, but there are a number of books out there. There's also a number of places that you can go and get a little bit of help. Um, you can also, on the next section, I'll talk to you about checking things for ADA accessibility. And so I believe now we're just gonna have a little bit of a quiz about what we just talked about. And I'll turn that over to Andrew to run the quiz. So yeah, thank you so much. That was very uh, informative. Uh, so this is it. So we have this poster by a person uh, working on optimality theory. For those of you that might not recognize the topic, um, and, which is a theory within phonology. And yeah, which elements do you think, uh, which elements from those that Miranda just talked about, and I put those here on the left, uh, contrast, alignment, repetition, and proximity, which elements do you think that could be improved? Now, Miranda and Shannon, do you think we should just like do it through chat? Should we let people talk? Should we like, how do you think we should do this? Maybe a mix of both. If people would like to unmute and talk about the elements they see, that'd be great. And if people are more comfortable popping things in the chat, we can monitor there and um, share with the group. Perfect. So uh, take a minute to, um, and again, you don't have to read specifically what they're saying because that's not what we're talking about. What's the overall impression that you get from looking at this poster? Imagine yourself, you can get yourself like, two feet backwards from your computer and imagine like imagine yourself that in a in a conference and you see this poster what do you think and again there's many good things about this poster we're not we're not saying that it's bad in any way uh because this person did a great job with the research but when it comes to visual effects that we get from this poster what could be uh improved so that's what we're trying to do here so yeah, feel free to drop it in chat, unmute yourself, raise your raise your hand emoji thingy, and we can chat. So we do have one observation already in the chat, um, pointing mm -hmm. out alignment here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marcin, uh, if that's how you pronounce your name, uh, says alignment, and Tran, hey Tran, uh, says, uh, <laughs> It's hard to know what the boxes are doing. I'm a little overwhelmed. I think that's a generic feeling that we all had when we saw just this, because it's a lot of information, you know? So it's kind of like what uh, we were saying at the beginning that you don't want to put everything from your abstract onto the onto the, um, mm -hmm. onto the the poster. And Shannon will talk more about how do you choose what's important, right? Well, she'll talk yeah. more about that. Uh, the alignment, yeah, definitely, especially if we're looking at both alignment and the use of white space, right? So there are places where, for example, in the one, two, three, the column that starts with serial variation on the top, we can see all these little boxes intruding to the left, right? So the um, step one, on, so it's the penultimate column from the right. Uh, sorry, I am a phonologist, you can tell here. Um, so you can see how these things aren't quite aligning um, and that makes it feel even more crowded when when things don't align and when you don't have these lovely little white spaces between the columns, it becomes an, it becomes very overwhelming. And in a way, really like you're trying, your brain almost wants to read it this way, but there's just enough white space to make you go this way. Um, and there's also, uh, does anybody else notice anything that they think for proximity, repetition or contrast? It's hard to evaluate a poster. <laughs> One thing I noticed too, is there's a whole bunch of white space um, right under references and to right of the last tableau. Yeah, Martha. I think just like other speakers have said, there are two main information. It's a no color contract, no rich information, is emphasized mm -hmm. so and um, 
Yeah. Um, the tables are not catchy, you know, they're not interesting mm -hmm. to, uh, to know what yeah. the paper is about. There's no title what the paper is all about. So basically, um, there are too many information. Yeah. And it's not interesting to, to really know what the paper is all about. Thank you. Nice. Oh, thank you. So every poster is improvable. Like I like to think that that's just like teaching. Like there's many ways to do a poster correctly, and there's many ways to do it well, right? So, but in this case, there's things that you know that could be changed, but it does convey some good information. Um, so moving on to the next one, unless anybody has one last comment about it. Nice. Okay. Um, one of the things that I find very important from um, just in my own personal and professional life is accessibility in design. Uh, everybody should be able to look at your poster, to access the information in your poster. And there's multiple ways that we can do this. Um, one is including a digital version. For anybody that is low vision or blind, having a digital one that is screen reader friendly um, really is create a larger audience for your poster, right? Um, and if you are doing a digital version, one thing you really need to have is what we call alt text for images. I think most of us are familiar, but just in case we aren't, alt text is a prose-based description of the image itself. So this makes it accessible, accessible to low vision and blind individuals. Um, and so make sure you do have that. Even because screen readers don't read tables really well, um, <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's helpful, especially if you've inserted, say, like a tableau or a table as an image into your uh, PDF or whatever you're using, you want an actual alt text description of the table and tell us, telling us what it shows, right? Um, so keep accessibility in mind whenever you're designing anything, this comes to fonts, spacing, colors, and images. So turning first to fonts. Um, make them big, <laughs> make them huge. You would be shocked at how big it has to be. So bigger is better, right? You want a title that should be legible? I'm not kidding, from 10 to 15 feet away, right? So the LSA poster sessions, usually the, the little aisles that we walk through, if that's the way they're organized this time, it's probably not gonna be that far. It's probably gonna be more like six feet. Um, but in theory, you want it so that if I'm walking, People just walk down the post aisles and they're just kind of like looking as they go by. You want them to be able to read your title from afar. Um, we'll talk about, Shannon will talk about titling in general, but visually you want it there. That's when you want, that's why we tend to use color up there and we use contrast up there. You want them to be able to read it from far away. Your title, the ideal font size is 158 points. I know that it's huge. Remember, these things are four feet across <laughs> and three feet down, right? Um, 72 points is the minimum. You want to be able to see these things clearly and easily from far away. Section titles can be 46 to 56, depending. These are just averages, right? Body, do not go smaller than 24. Um, if you, that's like when you're doing a PowerPoint. If you're doing a PowerPoint for a class, you should never go under 18 point font. Um, for body text on posters, nothing under 24 point font, or you just can't read it. Now, what kind of font you use is also important. So you've got big font. You need to use non-serif or sans-serif fonting. This means it doesn't have little squiggles on the edges, right? Um, so avoid serif when possible. I understand with the IPA um, and maybe with other things you aren't, you can't. And so in those cases, you can. One of the reasons is serif fonts in general are harder to read. Um, and they're much more difficult for people with dyslexia. Um, one of the most friendly dyslexic fonts is Comic Sans. I'm not saying go run out and use Comic Sans on your poster, but you know, Mont I think this is in Montserrat, um, uh, Helvetica, Verdana, Calibri, Arial, all of these are excellent fonts. If you'll notice though, even though the font in this slide, Helvetica is written in Helvetica, Verdana in Verdana, so on and so forth, right? But notice that Calibri, for example, is much smaller than the other one. So if you're trying to figure out like, oh my gosh, I don't have enough room in my poster, looking through the serif, sans serif fonts, you can, Calibri is going to be one that's going to save you a little bit of space. 
Uh, it's my preferred go-to font. <laughs> now, colors, font colors. Often we just use black, right? That tends to be the most typical, but sometimes we do play around. Black text, black text on white background is the best, right? Or if you're gonna do the reverse, white text on black background. Though I don't think any of you wanna pay for printing a black background poster. So <laughs> I to keep it white text on black. Now, if you want to use different color backgrounds, make sure the colors are highly contrastive. In general, avoid using green and red, green and brown, green and blue, green and gray, green and black. Just don't use green. <laughs> Save yourself the problem and just don't use green. Blue and gray and blue and purple are also problematic. So if we look at the font colors in the next example, um, on the left, we have some accessible. We have blue on red. We can see it. Uh, but if we look at the one on the right, we have the red on the green. And so for individuals with red green color blindness, there's actually not gonna be a, a distinctual difference. At most, it might appear as a slightly lighter black or darker gray. And that might not be enough to draw your attention to these different, it looks like case endings. <laughs> case endings, okay, yeah. I remember enough about syntax. Um, <laughs> so on the next one is the spacing. Right, so you've got the right size, you've got the right colors. Do not crowd that poster. Don't just say that. You can tell us verbally. Less is more on a poster, right? If you need to write out everything you want to say on some note cards and keep them there, it's okay, right? It's especially if it's your first poster, it's okay to be nervous, and you have to remember that most of the people that come up to you have been where you are, and they are going to be sympathetic, right? Um, so do not crowd the poster. You want to use at least a 1.2 line spacing, at least, and up to two point is good. Make sure the letters of each word have adequate spacing. This shouldn't be a problem, except if you've chosen a font that has more condensed spacing, you can find in Word what kind of fonts have this type of spacing. Um, or if you brought something in as an image and you're resizing it, and you accidentally, like, instead of, like, resizing equally on both axis, you like just push it in on one side and then it goes and all your font is just all tall and skinny together. So keep the font spacing. So here we have an example from two of my posters where I did well and I did not do so good. That's the only place I say good and bad because they're mine. <laughs> so in the first one, we have good white space. Just visually looking at it, it is so much easier to understand, right? And it's easier to follow. If we look on the right, I have just grouped stuff too close together. Um, and I, there's a way I could have reverted this. I'm also using, if you notice, serif fonts in my one on the right. I'm using sans serif on the left. Um, on the left, I'm making much more use of white space um, as opposed to the one on the right. Um, so even in my own posters, I I miss some and I, I hit some, right? <laughs> the last thing that we'll look at when it comes to this is charts, graphics, and images. Charts need to be accessible. And this comes down to considering especially color and shape. You want to use icons and shapes to help code color code the information, right? You cannot rely on the color alone to convey the information that you need. One, what happens if your color poster gets printed gray? And black and white and you get there and you're like uh-oh all of my lines are the exact same thing now and I can't tell what's going on like you know instead of say using a red line and a green line to show a plot use dots and squares right because then even in gray you can tell the line that's made up of little teeny dots versus little teeny squares is somehow different um you want to use direct labels for every line so that people know what you're doing Dash lines or varying the stroke thickness along the colors can really help. And then if you're using, say, pie graph or any sort of chart like that, you want to add white lines between the, like, pied elements, the pie wedges. I don't know what we call those things. So if we look at this next example, this is an inaccessible chart. So this is the one on the left. These are just random charts I grabbed off the internet because I didn't have any in our posters. Uh, but I was looking at this. So if we look on the left, they're conveying information about six different items. 
But on the right, a person with colorblindness only sees four, right? So it, essentially we have lost information about at least two of our elements. Now, if we redo this chart on the next page, on the next slide, we can see how it then becomes accessible. By putting these little white lines between each wedge, they become distinct and they pop out. So even if an individual is colorblind, the white lines tell them the distinctions between the wedges. And then the next one is our graphics and our images, right? Make sure everything's labeled, <laughs> just label it. Make sure you have good captions going on. If you have a digital poster, remember use your alt text. Don't put your text over your images. Do not use an image as the background of your poster, just don't. It's too distracting. It's, it may look lovely and cool, but it's just good to track from what we want in the poster, which is the information, right? So don't put text over images. Do not use an image as a background. Um, make sure the resolution is correct before printing. You want a minimum of a 300 DPI, preferably higher, but just make sure you have good resolution images. So I will turn it over to Ander for a best practices quiz as far as accessibility. So same story. Uh, just so that you know, the poster my oops, I try to make it anonymous by moving the box, but it moved. So it's uh, okay. These people were fine by sharing their information, but just in case. Um, I want you to think that this poster, it looks shrunk just because it had to fit within this slide, but it is actually quite big. Okay. So don't think that it should be bigger. Okay. Think that it's actually big enough. Uh, that's not the issue here. Uh, but same story. What do you think about this poster? Now we're looking at a, a one that is on in portrait mode because sometimes you will see what you need to do for the LSA, but like sometimes you're free to do whatever you want. You can do it on landscape or a portrait. So whatever you prefer, you go for that. So what do you think about this one? What are some of the pros, some of, some of the cons? specifically relating it to what um, the second part that uh, Miranda was talking about. So font, size, uh, um, accessibility, and same story. You can raise your hand or drop a message on the chat. Take some time. I don't know why the box moved because I left it perfectly aligned. <laughs> the alignment was good <laughs> before. Any messages on the chat? I don't see any. Would anyone uh, like to share something orally of what you see in here? It doesn't have to be like improvements. If there's something that you really like about what they're doing, you can say that as well. Somebody said something. Tran says pros. Sections are broken up really clearly. Con. It's hard to know right away if we're supposed to read column one, then column two, or row one, and then row two, and then row three. That's actually a good point. Anything else? That's a good point, Tron. Thank you for sharing that. I wonder if the type of language and the type of writing system that you have affects that, you know, like if you're a native speaker of Arabic, like would you be more prone to reading, you know, a certain way? And if you're a type of person that writes or your native tongue is like, you know, left to right, would you do something differently. And if you speak Japanese, you know, that you go up to down, you know, like, I guess, I wonder if there are biases here, experiments. Okay, uh, Miranda, would you like to say something quick about what you, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Marcin, Marcin said, use a sans serif uh, font instead, avoid small, typefaces. I don't remember the specific size of, of um, the phone that they were using, 
but you can see that the, the size that they're using is different. Like the one in conclusions is certainly smaller than uh, other sections. Like what you can read here and here, this is way smaller than what it is before. Thank you, Marcin, for, for sharing that. Miranda, anything else you would like to add for what you were saying? That's the one thing I, that's one of the first things I would have like mentioned was the, the type, the sensor, use sensor font. Um, you know, they have the dark green, light green, um, that works, right? Uh, I personally would have gone with something that wasn't green and maybe two different colors, uh, just to make it a little bit more contrastive and a little bit more accessible. Um, but there is a couple of things where they do have fonts that are too small. I mean, most of these are like their citations. So, you know, that's not something they're terribly interested in. You can't tell from your view, but maybe you can. They're using a light gray on a dark gray background for the little bubble text. Just go straight white at that point, right? The That little bit of light gray, the, you could be more contrasted, right? And that would be much more helpful. Um, so it can, you know, be really, they have a couple other elements like the use of the little hand, which I find very confusing because as a phonologist, that pointy hand means something. Oh me, yeah. Right? Whereas they're just using it as a bullet point, but in my brain, it's been coded to mean something. So if you're a phonologist, you see pointy hand, you know, it's like using the bomb in, <laughs> in phonology, we know what that means. Uh, so, you know, there's a couple of things they have, uh, the pictures are a little bit small, but it's hard to tell until you're actually in person mm -hmm. how this comes up. So um, in general, there are some things they can do better, but it is a pretty decent poster. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say that when I saved it as a PDF, it was certainly longer than the usual PDF that I have. So I'm sure that it is actually, maybe they did like the mm -hmm. three by four, um, but like in, in, in portrait mode. Yeah. Great. And that's something to consider is, if you want to do a poster like this, typically at the LSA, if you haven't been before, they are up on these little like felted, like movable chalkboards is how I think of them, but they're felted, right? And that's how you put them on. So there, there may not be enough space to go four feet long. I don't know. So that's something you have to consider is where you'll be displaying the poster as far as sizing. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen some conferences where they didn't specify that it had to be in landscape mode and then you get there and they have those panels as we'll show you at the end of the presentation and then it looks it I don't want to say that it looks bad but like you know you've worked on your like portrait mode uh, uh, poster and then suddenly half of your poster is hanging like down the the panel you know and in and and it doesn't look that professional or nice in a way but it's yeah so it's good. Always ask. Like if you, the LSA already told us it has to be um, uh, in in landscape mode. But if you don't know it, ask the organizers just in case because they should know. Perfect. Miranda, no Miranda, Shannon. Sorry, <laughs> Miranda said enough. No, thank you. So, and, and Miranda did give us a lot of really great information about what we should be keeping in mind, really with respect to the visuals, how to make sure that this visual display of information is accessible and is conveying the information we want to get across. And one of the things that Andrew started out with as well is, you know, one of the starting points that I think a lot of us use, and I certainly do use this when we're trying to think about what's going to go in that poster, is starting from the abstract that got us the poster in the first place. But of course, you know, and that might be the starting point, just copying and pasting what you have in the abstract into a poster space, that's not the end point. Because again, we're trying to make sure we're maximizing the amount of information we're getting across. And we want to make sure that we're getting the most important information across to the people who are walking past that poster. So that means that we're going to have to inevitably cut some information down. So what I'm going to be talking about in this section is what I've called curating content. That is figuring out exactly what to include in that poster and how to make sure the most important information is getting across to, um, to your audience. And something I wanna say right at the start before we jump into these different points is there is no one size fits all template for what to do here and what to include. It's going to depend a lot on your particular project. 
There are different conventions um, when we look across subfields. If we're comparing theoretical and experimental work, there's totally different you know, types of information that we're going to include. So Miranda just walked us through charts, but you might be in a type of field where you're never going to put a chart on a poster. So what I'm going to try to do here is not tell you this is what to do or what not to do, because again, there is no one size fits all. Instead, I just want to give us a little bit of food for thought, some things to be thinking about while you're figuring out exactly what information you do want to include. Okay, so the first thing we're going to be thinking about is your work at a glance. As Miranda already said, you really should bear in mind the, the fact that people are going to be walking past your poster and what you want to do is really catch their attention. And But more than that, give them a sense of what your work is about without them having to come in too close. Um, and I think the six foot rule is maybe a good rule of thumb. And bear in mind that this is really hard to judge when you're building your poster on your little computer screen. Of course, it is very different when it's all blown up. But something that is certainly true is that, and Miranda said this as well already, bigger is better. The more important in, in piece of information is, the bigger it should be on your poster, the more prominent it should be. So again, this is going to be a little bit difficult to simulate when you're just looking at your computer screen, but when you're figuring out what information to include and what information to emphasize, ask yourself, would someone walking by, say six to 10 feet away from your poster, would they know what your work is about? Of course, the title gives a lot away, or hopefully the title gives a lot away, but there's probably more, a little bit more detail you hope they can pick up on just at a glance. And also, what would that person, as they're walking by, be able to say about your work after they walk away? So this is really, again, just your starting point, the guiding questions, thinking about what is most important and what are they going to be able to glean, even just as they're passing by in this really crowded poster room. OK, and so on the next slide, you know, what I try to think about when I'm figuring out what to emphasize, what information to include is what I'm calling here the big three. These are really three questions um, to, that I use when I'm trying to, again, decide what to actually put on the poster. First, what's the main question guiding your work? As an audience member for your poster, I would like to be able to figure out really easily, not having to do any digging, what it is that, what the guiding question is, what your work ultimately is addressing. And of course, incredibly importantly, what's the answer that you offer to that question? What are your conclusions? What's your big takeaway? And finally, what about your contribution are you most excited to share? And actually, Miranda suggested something else that relates to this. What would you like feedback on? What do you want people to dig into and discuss with you after you give your beautiful six to seven minute run through the poster? Now, this last point is where it's really going to depend on you and your work. Again, there is no one size fits all uh, answer here. It really depends on the project. So sometimes it might be a new theory or a new framework framework that you really want to get out there. Other times it's all about the data, or maybe you've come up with a new experimental method or a new method of elicitation that you want to share with the field. So this is something for you to think about. In addition to that main question and your answer, are there other details about what you've done that you really want to bring to people's attention and really want to be talking about with your audience members? Okay. Um, so and, and actually, and Miranda alluded to this a second ago. So again, we're thinking about at a glance, we're thinking about what people, what information people can extract without having to lean in too close, just as they're walking by. And obviously the biggest thing on your poster is always going to be those titles, those section headers. And we saw a lot of really, really nice examples with very prominent section headers already. So something you can consider, and I'll admit this isn't something that I've done consistently in my own posters, is actually making those section titles informative. So section titles, and we've seen this already, are a really important guide through the content of the poster. They can almost so serve as a roadmap telling us what we should be looking at and in what order. But titles, section titles can also be informative in their own right, giving people a sense at a glance what the big takeaway for your poster are. So just one example uh, I came up with here is, you know, it's really common for people who do experimental work to have a section that is titled methods, because of course we want to know your experimental methods. But something you might be con you might consider doing is being a little bit more specific in that title. For instance, saying, I so I use a lot of acceptability judgments in my own work. 
I could actually have a title that says methods acceptability judgment survey. So then someone walking by the poster is already going to have an idea of what sort of experimental methods I've engaged in without having to come in and see the, the full picture. So that's just one of those places where your titles are already going to be very big. You can think about using your titles and the bigness of those titles to convey a little bit more detail about the work that you're presenting there. Okay. Um, and this, I mean, really more than anything, and Miranda already explained this so beautifully, it is so important not to overcrowd your poster because this is a visual display of information. And it's so important that people are able to interact with that information with as much ease as possible because the easier it is to figure out what it is you're communicating, the more they can engage with it and the more feedback and questions and comments you can get. So, and, and this really does go hand in hand with figuring out what information you actually do want to put on that poster. So even if you use your abstract as a starting point, I really do recommend doing a little bit of revision to try to simplify the overall picture that you're putting there. So um, actually, well, something I said on the previous slide that you would have seen is that bullets are better than sentences, are better than um, paragraphs. The, the more condensed you can get, the better. And so now on the next slide, we can see an example of this. So on the left, this is actually the introduction section from one of the posters that we saw already when we were talking about the CARP principles. And I think that a lot of us already got the sense that this was a lot of information squeezed into a small space. It's really difficult to just looking here to figure out at a glance what I'm supposed to be taking away from this section. So what I've offered on the right is uh, my totally naive uh, attempt at a revision that helps make this in the same information a little bit clearer. So looking first at the red box at the very top, here the poster maker, I mean, they have used bullet points, but notice that we have multiple sentences in the second bullet point. So we've they've used the structure of bullets, but really this is looking a lot like a paragraph. So something you can consider even without a bullet point is how you can turn these three sentences into one. Because remember, sentences are always going to be better than paragraphs on the poster. For the blue box, here we have the goals of the paper. And this person has used really nice bolding to let us know, to draw the eye into these goals because the... Um, the goal, the goal is really important, but it's hard to parse within that paragraph again what the goals ultimately are. So in my, my proposed revision, here I've turned this paragraph of text into a list of bullets, breaking down the three, um, the three models that the poster is going to ultimately evaluate into three separate bullets and using a little bit more bolding there, again, to help the person at a glance see what it is that this poster is going to be doing. And finally, for the final, the, the orangish yellow box, box at the par, uh, bottom, here too, that we do have, well, instead of bullets, we have letters. So we're using a different convention here. But once again, we have these full sentences and we can think about how can we turn these full sentences into these nice little bite-sized chunks, these little bullets, the same overall information, but in a more condensed way. And what you'll notice is a lot of what I've cut, if we're doing the side-by-side -side comparison, a lot of what I've cut here are just extra words that you might want to say and probably were said in the abstract, but certainly don't contribute information on the poster. So for instance, the sentence, here are points I argue for in this paper, you can just give the points. You don't have to give the preamble in the way that you would when you're if you're giving a talk, because we want to just jump right into that information. So when you're thinking about how to consolidate, the first thing to ask is how can I turn paragraphs into sentences and sentences into bullets? And the second is what, what is some of this, um, you know, these more conversational elements that I might include when I'm talking about something, but that don't actually convey information on their own. And you'll notice that just in these simple changes where I'm still conveying the same information, we're getting a lot more white space and a lot more clarity, making it a lot easier to be able to engage with all of these different pieces of information. Okay. So going, moving forward then. Um, I'm gonna, uh, Shannon, I just, just point that Miranda wrote a great comment that she said that the use of bold in Shannon's revision creates contrast and draws your eye 
to the important information just oh yes really, really awesome yeah no th thank you for that yeah and and that's exactly right because you know one of and again all of this is intertwined so when you're thinking about information and what information to include at the same time you should be thinking about what are the most important pieces even within that information so indeed i have used bold here to help draw what is even within a sentence what's most important in that sentence yeah thank you ander um so uh, this is, again, really just picking up on the theme of how to present this information and how to make sure that at a glance, your audience is able to take away what is most important and what you really are hoping to communicate to them. But what this inevitably means is you are going to have to cut something. You cannot fit everything. And really making a poster is all about finding this careful balance between necessary detail and legibility, making sure you're including everything that the audience needs to understand those big three points, um, but and making sure the information on the poster is self-contained so I can look at the poster and get a complete story, but also making sure that it is still readable and still um, accessible to your audience, okay? So um, some things that you can think about on the next slide of what you might want to cut. Um, really it's all about letting go of the finer points. And here I've just included some places where, and especially in some of the examples we've seen, we see where we might be able to trim a little bit. Now I know, I mean, this is true for all researchers, everything is important to us. We see the big picture, we see how all of these details fit together, but you're the expert on your work. Remember that you're presenting it to people who don't know as much. So think about it as giving them the starting story, right? Setting them up to where they can start to engage with this research that you have labored over. And so some of the places where we can often trim things down to, in fact, make the, the information more impactful for our audience, the first place is often going to be the background section. We always want to to demonstrate that we have really engaged thoroughly with this literature, and we know all the ins and outs of the literature that we're building on. But for the audience member, really what's going to be most important are, is just enough information to motivate your question and your approach. So sometimes that means leaving out some of the works that have spoken to this problem in the past. In some posters, that means leaving out the background altogether, depending on how much you actually need to get the your question and your answer on the table. So here, remember, it's not about, you, you don't have to prove to anyone that you've done the reading. We know that you have. It's really about giving us enough information to understand what your new contribution is rather than what people have said before. Another place, and actually the um, example we looked at just a second ago kind of shows this, is thinking about language data. Now, especially if you're in the business of collecting new data, if data is what you really want to share, then you absolutely should share it. But sometimes we're using data just to kind of set up the question and set up the approach, but it's not about the data itself. Now, if that's the case for you, then think about including just enough data to capture the core phenomenon. That might even be a single example that demonstrates the contrast you're interested in, okay? Um, maybe that feels a little unsatisfying. And again, this does depend on what your contribution is and what you're excited to share. But you know, if, 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 you only, if it only takes one minimal pair to get the contrast across, then leave it at one minimal pair and save that space for other information. Um, similarly with experimental methods, if your main contribution, what you're excited about is a new method, of course, you're going to, you know, put a lot of information there. That's what you'll focus on. But if you're using a known method, a method that is, uh, you know, often used in your subfield, then you probably don't have to say as much as you think you do. Because remember, this is not the peer reviewed journal article. You're not trying to get it past reviewers. You're just trying to get the audience enough of an idea of what you did so that they can assess whatever conclusions you're presenting to them. So offer just enough to get a general feel for the task. Say generally what type of task it is, maybe give a little bit of an example of the stimuli, but you might not have to give us every single detail about recruitment or the procedure or exclusion criteria, all of these other things that we care a lot about as experimenters. Because remember, if someone is wondering, they can ask you and you can actually absolutely tell them. But that's going to be, those are going to be the level of details that come after that first glance, that, you know, quick overview. On the poster, give just enough for people to appreciate and understand where your findings are coming from. 
And finally, a place where we can often trim down is in the discussion section. And here, I think what's most important is to prioritize the direct implications of your work over open questions or future directions. So something I said about this before and that I really do think is true is that posters are really a celebration of the work that you've accomplished so far. It's not about emphasizing the work that's still to be done. You can absolutely talk about that in the discussion with your audience members, and I'm sure they would be very excited to hear what the future the directions for this work are. But on your poster, keep it about what you have managed to do. Really, you know, drive home, this is what I am contributing to the literature. This is what I am offering to science, all right? So, um, there's one other place where I think we can often save some space. And this is in the reference section. And here actually, and even as we talked about this, uh, you know, we sometimes feel a little bit conflicted on what to do here. So again, this is not, these are not rules. This is just something to think about. Research doesn't exist in a vacuum. And we always, always want and need to acknowledge the work that has informed our work, right? But it's also true that reference sections take up a lot of precious poster real estate. You know, we saw several examples already where you're taking up a really big chunk of space to try to cram in those references. So some of the solutions that people do, well, on the one hand, extra tiny references. We, we've seen examples of this before. When we've talked about the minimum font that you want to have to make sure the poster is legible, well, maybe you can you can go a little bit smaller in the references because that's not going to be you know particularly important information for engaging with your work, right? Another thing people do, and I have certainly done, is to do select references. I might not include all of the references that are relevant to the work. Maybe not all of the references I included in the abstract. Maybe just two or three that are mo most central to setting up the question that I have asked in the work that I'm presenting. Maybe, and this is a little bit more radical. We can just leave the references out altogether, you know, because again, this is going to be the above and beyond type of information. But the, again, I, you know, that's something that I always feel a little bit weird about. I always feel like I do want to acknowledge the work. And sometimes you really, especially if you're building on a prior approach or you're assessing a prior theory, you're going to want it there. But something you can remember is if you don't include references on the poster, you can include them somewhere else. And this is what I'm going to call online overflow. Anything that's not on that poster, you can put online. That includes more data examples. That includes more background, more references, more details about the methods. All right. Um, and you, and some of what you can do, and some of what I've done in some of my posters, is actually include a QR code. The QR code I have here is a QR code from the most recent poster that I made with um, collaborators. And what we link to there is both a PDF of the poster, um, as well as a more detailed handout that included all of the beautiful detail that we couldn't possibly fit on the poster itself. And like I said, this is also somewhere where you can, you can link to a repository where you have, for instance, experimental stimuli or raw data, really anything else that you think could be helpful for your audience, but just doesn't have space on the poster. So if there's something that you feel like, well, maybe this isn't so crucial to conveying my big three, but it's something that I do want to have accessible to people if they're wondering, move it online, give them a link, give them a QR code. Okay. So I think after this, I just have a couple of more example posters for us to think about. Um, and here it's really about your impressions of it. And I know these are kind of small. I mean, I guess you can zoom in. Um, again, it's much bigger when it's in person. But think about this, play a little game of I spy. Um, and what you want to be looking for and see how easy or hard it is for you to find is, can you find the central question that this work addresses? Can you find a succinct summary of the answer that this work provides? And what else is jumping out at you? And you can ask yourself as well, what do you like best? And in light of everything you've heard today, is there anything you would do differently? So just like before, um, if you have any comments, you can unmute yourself and offer them, or you can plop them in the chat. But again, this is just thinking about how easy is it for you to find this mo the most important information? And is there anything you would change to make it a little bit easier?
And here, Andrew Miranda, if you have any thoughts on this too. I want to let the attendees say something first. I do have my opinions. So let's see if somebody shares something in the next minutes. And if not, I can say what I think or something that I would have. Um, somebody said yeah. something. Um, yeah, Tran, the conclusions are clearly marked and broken up into macro and micro. I found this to be incredibly attractive as a poster. It's a mm -hmm. little busy on the first look, but in a good way. The clipboards, pill bottles made it inviting. And um, if I saw this in person, I would definitely want to see what the presenter has to say. Um, I certainly agree with all of that. And I do, especially the macro and micro. And one of the reasons I wanted to put this here, um, really two reasons, since we're talking about the conclusions that I wanted to share this example. The first is you'll notice the conclusions are in that left column. They haven't put the conclusions over on the right. You're not having to read through all of the details. Really, they're putting it right at the jump, setting up the overview, the problem, and the conclusions. And that use of macro and micro to guide your eye to these two different levels of takeaway, maybe it's the actual conclusions are a little bit small. You might have to get a little closer to the poster to see where the, what they are. But certainly, there's no question of where they are. It immediately is drawing your eye to it. Something else, anything else, people? I'll add that I think it's very attractive. I agree, I 100% agree with uh, Tran. Something that um, makes me feel like, ah, I wish it would be different is the reference section because I think everything is beautiful, same font size. And I think then uh, Peter just felt, um, that he had to include the references, as you were saying, Shannon, right? Like, I want to cite my work, but I feel like a more effective way to do this could have been, like, literally making the acoustic and context analysis uh, figures bigger. Not that they need that, because they're quite already big, but, like, if he wants to, like, fill up that space, or there's not just, like, white space, make them, like, a little longer. And then for the reference section, just include a QR code, and let's take you that that will take you to the reference section. And I've seen that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Dan has offered in the in the um, chat as well that the organization is yeah. great, the overall organization. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that as well. Um, it is a really accessible poster insofar as, you know, um, seeing the distinct sections, the alignment is beautiful, the flow is works really nicely. Um, it's, I think it's pretty easy to follow. Yeah. I would add, I would add, uh, relating it to what Miranda had said before about repetition, notice that we are given a color coding system here where modality is mm -hmm. going to be blue and voice quality is going to be orange. And now here, this is blue uh, squares and then this is orange square, you know, so um, we do have that color coding um, being repeated across um like differences. Yeah. yeah, I really, really enjoy that. The only thing I think that like, one, I would have got rid of the references section. I just think that um, QR codes for references are the way to go. Honestly, we all have phones. Um, but you know, that's, this is from UC Davis, which is what, 27, 2019. I should know I was there. <laughs> 2019. So I mean, even then, though, we still had enough that you would use that. Um, the one thing too, is that when I look at, for example, um, I love the red blue continuation, but when we get into the frequency analysis in that first chart there, mm -hmm. then we have this red occurring, but this red is not is not coding with the rest of the red in the poster. So I nice probably room. would have brought in an additional color or two colors to just look at permissive versus restrictive, just so that we could keep that red blue um, coding information we wanted to and have something different. I see why they did it. It's visually very appealing. <laughs> so I get why they did it. But on the same note, that actually threw me off a little bit in trying to apply what they coded to blue and red to mean. I was trying to That's apply true. it somehow. But otherwise, like I think it has a really lovely use of graphic elements. There's good contrast. I might have shortened up some of the text just a little bit mm -hmm. um, or yeah. given it more space by taking out that references so I can have a little bit more light. But overall, I find it to be a really engaging poster. 
Yeah. yeah, no, you're right. Actually, I, I went for the first, like the biggest things, but it is true that then when you look at the figures as well here, you have blue, red and gray and the red has nothing to do. It's just like red is pain. And here is a request for opiates. So then we add, yeah. But visually speaking, I think they were just trying to keep it more minimalist. Um, yeah. yeah. And in Peter's defense, I would say 2019, he was a graduate student. So I'm pretty sure that that's why he had all these references because he was like, don't come at me. This is this is my <laughs> my receipts, you know? Um, so we've all done. We've yeah. all, I, I, I used to do that in grad school. I always had all my references there too. So, mm -hmm. But here we can also think a little bit about that curation and a little bit about that editing because two of mm. those references, so they say this study um, draws on speech act theory and context models, and they have references for both of those. Mm -hmm. We might not need that so much, right? That's, I mean, because, you know, we can, we're always, if we're not already familiar with those models, we're going to have to go look at those theories. We're going to have to go look them up anyway, but Google's our friend, right? So here situating the, the frameworks that are used for this work, I think it makes a lot of sense. And it does help the audience engage with the work at the level that you're presenting it. But if we're, if we're doing a selected references method where we include some references on the poster, but not others, those are references that might not be as important for us to understand exactly what's happening in this poster. I don't know if you two, um, if Andrew and Miranda agree or disagree with that, but at least that's my impression here. Those are yeah. probably not as important for me to understand what's going on in the poster. Yeah. And one other thing that, oh, sorry, oh, yes. We had, a question, we had a question in the chat. That's what I was just popping up. Borum had wondered, does the QR code usually go into the poster itself or do you put it on a separate piece of paper? Ah, so I have provided the QR code actually in the um, heading banner, so adjacent to the title, so it's really easy and they can scan it there. Having it on a separate piece of paper, I think, would also work really nicely. Mm -hmm. um, the benefit of having it on the poster, we do often have a little bit of dead space up in that header. Um, and so it'd be easy for people who are maybe standing at a further distance to be able to use the QR code. If you have it on a piece of paper, maybe they have to approach you, get a little closer, um, it might, at least for shy people like me, it might discourage doing that. Um, but I can absolutely see it going either way. But for me, for, for my work, it was on the physical poster. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen, I've also seen, uh, Boram, I've also seen people, since you have, I'll show you in a second, those big, uh, panels some people print a big version of their QR code and just like put it next to their um um oh nice poster that works as well you know like just make sure that it's big enough that the phone is going to capture it usually phones are pretty good because it even works for like restaurant menus and stuff so I, it should be okay uh, there is uh, one more thing that I do want to add about this poster before we see another example is the conclusions were very easy for me to find. But something I realized in being an, an outsider to this type of work is it was a little bit harder to find a succinct summary of what the question was. So here I have the answers, but I maybe something that I would have done differently is try to use maybe a little bit more bolding, a little bit more emphasis in the overview, or maybe cut down on the wording a little bit there so that it's a little bit easier to understand what these are conclusions for, what, what the driving or the background um, issue is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we do have another example, but maybe we can skip the example and go on to the rest of the material if that would probably be a better use of time. Let's, uh, yeah, let's, like, I, yeah, we can do that just in case, in case they have questions uh, at the end. I'm going to be done really quick, really done, really quick. And um, Miranda has already shared a lot of examples from this particular uh, poster. So I think you've, 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 you've seen it. And you can see here the little hand that she was talking about. So, um, <laughs> Cool. So we're just going to finish the presentation with recommendations for the LSA that uh, V shared with us. And um, as you can see here in this picture on the right, if you're new to poster presentations, this is usually what you find in a big empty room. You find a lot of these panels. Um, and what you'll do is you'll open your uh, poster and you'll put it there. You will be assigned a board number and then you just have to look for it and just see where you are. Instead of wandering around, many times the conference venue or the conference organizers do provide you with a map to let you know where they are, like a smaller version of the room. And, and that helps a lot. 
Uh, they also said that post presenters will need, just in case, bring a, a, a set of uh, push pins just so that you can put it on. Sometimes uh, organizers give them to you, but it's not guaranteed. So always, just in case, bring a set of those with you. And they recommend to uh, uh, to do your posters uh, in landscape orientation where it's four, five, uh, four feet wide and three feet high. So this shape, okay? Uh, and this, uh, Miranda told us this because she's from the area or she lives in the area that if you don't know how to bring the poster with you, you don't have to bring it along with you. You can just send it to uh, FedEx, which the hotel that the conference is happening in um, has one and you can print it there. You can send it for pickup option and then you don't have to worry about carrying it with you. And of course, you just have to put the order ahead of time. And I'm adding this point here just because last year was the first time after COVID and all that, that I had to do a poster presentation because before that I had only done um, um, oral presentations. And I didn't know what to do for the plane because I didn't know if I was going to be able to have a printer where I was going to. And so I asked on Twitter, actually, I asked, hey, because you can buy one of those portable uh, tubes where you can put the, the big paper, that your, your, your posters. And I said, does this count as a personal item or not? And people had different opinions. Some people said, oh, you'll be fine. Usually people are nice and they let you just like, they put it on, the, um, um, on their uh, closet and then just like ask them about it. But I flew with Delta and they said, you can only have, uh, this is nothing against Delta, but you cannot have you can only have two items with you. And if you have more than that, you you can only have two. And they told me because they saw it and they said, no, this counts as one. So that's an issue if you're going with your, you know, with a carry-on and a backpack and that's all you're bringing for like a three-day conference. Um you might have to bring a small backpack if you're bringing the tube, or otherwise as uh do some research and print that there. And now that I'm thinking, I did present one thing in Barcelona one time. And luckily enough, I had friends there and they told me that the architecture school was nearby and the architecture school usually has to print big uh, uh, things for them. So I use their uh, printer. But of course, like the LSA doesn't present at universities. So it's usually hotels. So uh, learn about that and know that you can do this uh, there as well. And information that... Uh, I was uh, provided so that you uh, use this is that um, important times are that on Friday and Saturday at the LSA, posters can be put up as early as 8 a.m. and they need to be ready by 10.30. And then uh, posters but must be removed by 5 p.m. on that same day because then we were going to have a, a new poster session the next day. Notice that it's going to be earlier on Sunday. I know we're giving you this information way ahead of time, but uh, and this will be shared with you again when the conference is closer, but just know that it will be by 8.30 and then it needs to be removed by 1 p.m. on Sunday. Um, yeah, so with that, I think, oh yeah, so sorry. Um, I, I don't know if it was uh, Miranda or Shannon that shared this information, but many universities, especially those that are research focused, have poster templates that align with their branding. You don't have to design a poster from scratch. Uh, we will also say that the uh, models that these universities use is usually the three column uh, model, as, as Miranda was saying, it's nothing too modern or anything. Uh, but this is good because if you're new to this, you already have a template. You just have to fill it up, you know, and uh, usually they recommend that you use a university uh, color so it aligns and looks pretty. But now you know that not everything is about making it look uh, pretty. We have to consider the, who the audience is. And what we have done is you have access to all the posters that we have shown, uh, this PowerPoint presentation, the LSA guidelines for posters, and some templates from some of our previous institutions um, in this URL that you see here. So tinyurl.com slash first gen poster, or you can scan this QR code as we were saying before, and you can access these um, uh, materials, okay? And with that, I think we are done. 
and uh, perfect timing. Sorry. Just a question. real quick thing. Um, I put in the chat a link to, um, if you want to print your poster at the hotel um, through their FedEx Kinkos, I did put a link that takes directly to there. And then also if you use LaTeX um, to design your poster, I put a link to a website that has the LaTeX templates for posters. And something that I should add actually now that you're saying that is that there is the option to print your poster on cloth um, which is very portable. So you don't have to worry about the additional item and, and all that. But I will say that I try to check the cost of this and it's really expensive. Like there are some, there are some companies that specialize, uh, like in that niche area that is very useful for many people doing poster presentations in different fields, not just linguistics. But I, I, it was like at least a hundred dollars to print it. So versus usually when you print these in FedEx or at least in the universities that I've been to, it was between twenty-five to forty dollars. That's how much I I've paid in the past to print these. Um, and usually, if you're a student, you can also get discounts. Um, or you can ask your advisor to maybe pay for it. Maybe they would do that if they're nice enough. Um. So with that, we finished the presentation. I think this was perfect timing. Uh, do you have any questions for us? There's chance. Yeah, I also wanna thank Miranda and Shannon for all the work they did because they, um, they bring a lot of expertise here. I was more like a, like a moderator here, but uh, they, they no, no, thank you so much for that, for sure. Wonderful. Well, it looks, I hope this is helpful for you all as you all hopefully don't begin your posters or work on your posters. I mean, but I know we're academics. We're all just starting them in two weeks. Um, <laughs> So I wish you all the best of luck. And after you process all this information, because it is a lot of information, right? And it's sometimes hard to come up with questions until you're actually doing it. But, you know, feel free to reach out to the First Gen Committee or to the three of us, and we would be happy to share any help or guidance. Um, I'm not presenting a poster at this conference, but I will be there. And um, I've created a lot of posters. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Perfect. Well, it seems like nobody nobody has any other questions. So I guess we can call it a day for this. And yeah, thank you for coming. And enjoy. If you go to the LSA, enjoy New York. I'm mm -hmm. sure it's going to be really pretty, maybe cold, but I'm sure it's pretty. Um, Wonderful. Cool. Well, hopefully see you all at the LSA. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone.